Paul, when I was doing my graduate work uh, in uh, neuroscience, biological science, I studied a lot of molecular biology. Um, but I never thought of it from a philosophical point of view, even though I loved philosophy in, in, a, in another part of my life. Uh, you worked on the philosophy of genes. So what, is that, what does that mean? And how would it have helped me in my study of molecular biology to understand the philosophy of genes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the word gene, when it was first introduced, uh, I think it's 1909 by Johansson, he says, we're just going to come up with a, a useful little sound, right, <laughs> for these things we're talking about that we don't know a lot about. Um, and he introduces this word gene and the distinction between genotypes and phenotypes. Since then, that idea has gone through a series of really scientific revolutions. And we've been left not with, uh, I think one well-known biologist said that uh, uh, the more we learn about genes, the less we can say what is a gene, hmm. right? Uh, so my interest has been in that intellectual evolution, how the idea has changed in the hundred and something years since it was introduced, and in what that teaches us about science, about how science works and, mm -hmm. and perhaps how we can okay. intervene to, to make it work better occasionally. So. Uh, with Carola Stotz, I studied the subject quite intensively for over a decade. And I say studied, we didn't uh, do the classic kind of, you know, we sit around and think about it. We went out and talked to a lot of biologists. And we did some paper-based questionnaires. Uh, and then we did a whole bunch of, of really fun online stuff where we would test our ideas by uh, asking uh, biologists to look at little examples of annotating a stretch of the genome and you know, answer questions like, in this, um, you know, with this data we've given you, how many genes are there in this stretch? Mm -hmm. okay? um, and various other kind of online questionnaires worked like that. So we really tried to sort of dig into how uh, geneticists in the broad sense of the term, it's a whole bunch, I mean, everyone uses molecular tools in biology these right. days, okay? uh, how they thought about these things called genes and why they thought about them like that. And so the metaphor we ended up with um, in, in the book we wrote about this was that the gene has many identities. Um, and that those identities are, they're shaped by the needs of the scientists in a particular field. So in each area of biology, people define genes to pick out the, either the, the different pieces of DNA or the different ways of thinking about those DNA that are useful in their field. So I'll give you a, a lovely example that we used in the book um, of how the gene can be two different things at once, mm. and that's fine. Uh, there is a, a disorder of um, the development of your digits, your fingers, which has been linked to a particular location in the genome. This is all you know, well, well understood. And the puzzle is that uh, you would normally say that we found the gene for this disorder. It's inherited in families. If we fix it, we fix the disorder. It's the gene for this disorder. It's called preaxial polydactyly, but that doesn't matter. Um, then you go and look at the DNA, and the sequence that you're looking at is in the middle of what's called an intron, one of the bits of a gene that's cut out and thrown away before it gets to do anything useful. So the variation there is in a bit of the gene that doesn't code for anything, gets cut out and thrown away. And the gene that that intron is in has nothing to do with how your limbs develop. So do we say we've discovered the gene isn't a gene? What do we say? Well, it turns out that what you've actually got is a distal regulatory region. What that means is it's a bit of DNA which something binds to, which affects how the DNA is working oh. thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of base pairs downstream. Oh, wow. So what we've shown here very simply is that there are two great ways of thinking about genes. You can think about a gene as if there's any little bit of the genome that does what Mendel's laws say. There's a, it's related to the phenotype, and it, you get one from your mom and one from your dad mm -hmm. and all that, right? Then that's a Mendelian gene. On the other hand, when biologists got really interested in the, what, are, what are genes, right? They got down, they looked at the DNA, and they discovered that one of the key things DNA does is to make proteins. So now we have, and then later on they discovered that they also make functional RNAs, but it didn't make a lot of difference. It meant that we could find stretches of the DNA which are read off and used, the product is then used to make something. 
And that's another thing we mean by a gene. A gene is one of the stretches of DNA that gets read off and used to make something. Mm. And that's the molecular conception of the gene. Now, these are both great ideas. Giving up either of those ideas would be scientific madness. They're really good ideas. They both trace back to Johansson introducing the word gene. What did he mean, this one or that one? He didn't know much about genetics. <laughs> he meant something that covers them both. And now we call them both, both genes. And we, again, we've shown that this doesn't cause any confusion in biology. If you say to somebody, yeah, we discovered the gene for this disorder. Hey, it's a distal regulatory region in a completely unrelated gene. Isn't that interesting? Everybody just moves. That's how human language works. Mm. People know in this context, I use the word this way. In this context, I use it that way. So we were really impressed with the, the flexibility of scientific cognition and the way that scientific ideas kind of evolve to meet the needs of different fields. And people kind of smoothly communicate because they, if they've got a scientific training, they know that uh, people use the word gene to mean slightly different things or they classify them differently in different fields. And when you work with people, you learn that. Was there a time when people were disturbed by such a radical difference? Absolutely. In the 1960s, um, a Nobel Prize winning scientist called Seymour Benzer oh. really started to get into the fine structure of genes. Um, and, or the fine, I should say the fine structure of the DNA. And he was struck by the fact that uh, traditionally people had thought that, uh, this is before we, we knew about DNA, that genes do three things. They are the units of function, they make stuff. They recombine with one another in, in reproduction and they mutate. And so the idea was genes mutate, genes you know, are reproduced, and, and genes make stuff. And he realized that at a structural level, these things are completely independent of one another. Mm. And so he said, we'll have to have three words. <laughs> we'll call them mutons, recons, and cistrons. Um, and that didn't work at all. People just went on calling them all genes. Okay? But using the language, in a more, the word cistron survived. People sometimes use the word cistron. Mm. Um, but uh, so, um, yeah, I think that's a beautiful example. The only problem, I think, is that because there are so many different ways of thinking about genes and because DNA is such an important molecule in, in making life possible, if you're um, not, you don't have a biological training, you hear genes do this, genes do that. Genes yeah. just seem like these amazing yeah. things that can yeah. do everything. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's a bit like discovering that things can do anything. It's because of what the word thing is very general, right? <laughs>